Welcome to Google Developers Live from Campus London. I'm Mandy Waite. I'm a developer advocate for the cloud platform at Google. And I'm Emma Jackson, and I look after Google's education programs in emerging markets. Um, and this is the next in our series of Women Tech Makers. We're delighted to have Trisha G with us today. Uh, Trisha is a developer at TenGen, the MongoDB company. She has expertise in Java high performance systems, is passionate about enabling developer productivity, and has a wide breadth of industry experience from the 12 years she's been a professional developer. She's a leader in the London Java community and also involved in graduate developer community. Welcome, Tricia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you along to Women Tech Makers. Uh, so the first question is basically just to kind of find out a bit more about you. Uh, you work at Tengen, yes. just down the road from here, just down the road from Campus London. Uh, tell us a bit more about the work that you do uh, at Tengen. So I, I'm a Java developer at Tengen, uh, and so Tengen make MongoDB. It's one of the new NoSQL databases, and um, as a as many databases have, it has a number of drivers for developers to work to code their application against because you can't just talk directly to the database. You've got to talk something from your application to, to the server. Mm -hmm. And um, Tengen have got t uh, 12 maintained drivers and a number of other community drivers in 12 different languages. And uh, I'm looking after the Java one along with another guy. Okay. So and it's interesting because we're working in an environment of lots of different languages and I'm used to working in a very Java-y environment. Okay. And it's really cool because you can learn some different stuff off, off different languages and different people with different backgrounds. So what other languages are you, are you working with at Tengen? I mean, and which ones particularly interest you most, right, other than Java? Well, uh, so I work quite closely with the C-sharp guys, because the Java and C-sharp drivers, yeah. we want them to be fairly similar. We yeah. want them to feel the same. So that's interesting because because we've got a lot of similarities. But the C-sharp platform has some things that, that Java doesn't have yet. So uh, for example, they do have some Lambda type functions, and, and Java won't get that till the end of this year. Yeah. Um, but then you look at some, like Node.js is really interesting because it's single threaded and asynchronous and, and it's a totally different way of, of working. But there's no reason that you can't get Java to look a little bit like Node.js if you wanted to. Okay. So you can borrow some stuff off them in terms of how they do their, their asynchronous uh, callback type stuff. Okay. And, um, and then you look at some of the dynamic languages and, and they work in an entirely different way. They've got sort of for the first time, I actually feel a little bit jealous of them because they've got real flexibility as to how they take stuff from one thing and turn it into another. Because yeah. as a driver, what you do is you take it from here and turn it into this. Mm. Normally, in, in enterprise applications, it doesn't work that way. You've got your Java application, and you do so you, you do your proper domain-driven design, and you've got your domain model, and, and you code it all in Java. And you shouldn't be turning things from this into this because it means you've done it wrong in the first place. Mm. So when you're writing an application where the only job is to turn it from this into this, you're like, oh, Java's not really easy to do that sort of thing. You've got to worry about garbage collection and things like that. Okay. So yeah, so for, for once I'm kind of a little bit jealous. A little bit jealous. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. But, so um, what actually excites you about the work that you're doing at the moment with Tengen? Well I'm in a lucky position actually. I've got hired at the point in time when we want to um, effectively rewrite the Java driver, um, which it was not really what I signed up for. I kind of signed up for doing some Java stuff and um, some evangelist type stuff. So I've got this dual role where I do coding, like a real developer, and go out to conferences and do presentations and, and do blogging. And I very much wanted a role where I could have those two things. Right. And I don't see, it's quite difficult to be taken seriously by developers when you're going out there and talking to them if you're not doing code as well. So it's important to do both things at the same time. However, I didn't really realize that we were going to do like a whole rewrite of the Java driver, which is uh, uh, both a curse and a blessing. Because yeah. it's cool, because you get to look at something which, ex which is currently in use that real people are using, and you, you can, you, you've got s a specification there because you've got something that already works, but you get to do it the way that you want to do it, and that's, that's really cool. Yeah. But it's quite a lot of work, and also we do have a lot of people using the existing one, and you don't want to alienate those guys, and you want them to be able to migrate to the new world order, and you don't want them to say nasty things about you. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. so. so yeah, let's talk a bit about how you got to where you are in your career at the moment. So the sort of path that you took to get there. Um, and I guess it started with your degree in computer science. What factored into that decision to study that? I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Oh, wow. I, I was really into science fiction and, and stuff, so I guess I was a bit of a geek as a teenager. Mm -hmm. And and I wanted to uh, I wanted to go to Mars and I wanted to be an astronaut and and I knew that probably wasn't really going to happen. Uh, but I thought astrophysics is a good way to look out into the stars and, and find out about you know 
the, the, the universe out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, so I did maths, physics, and computer science at A level, <laughs> and um, and uh, thinking that that's quite that's a good platform for almost any degree that you want to do. If you want to be, I knew I was. I kind of came from a difficult background, not like, not like family-wise. My yeah. parents are going to kill me. No, it was fine. <laughs> but um, I, I, when I did my GCSEs, I did ten very different subjects. I did, you know, maths and science, and English, and and French, and PE, and art. Now, almost no one else did, um, you know, did well in the the art and the PE and the mm. and and the, the maths and science and and English. So I had ten subjects, and I I, I got A's in all of them. <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> oh well. That's great, but you know where am I going to go from here? Yeah. And in terms of um, my sixth form choices, I wanted to do various. I, I would have liked to have carried on with art and things like that. But in terms of actual career prospects, I decided that um, maths, physics, and something else would allow me to choose pretty much whatever I wanted to. So although it looks like you're narrowing yourself down, in actual fact, I picked them because it wouldn't force me to narrow down very early on. You know, if I wanted to go on and do journalism, I could probably still go on and do journalism. If I wanted to be an artist, I probably didn't need a degree in art, for example. Yeah. So I did maths, physics, and computer science, thinking that you know maybe I can go on and be an astrophysicist and that'd be awesome. A and the physics was kind of hard, and the maths was a bit like, oh, well, it's just more you know imaginary numbers. I mean, no. seriously, <laughs> who needs an imaginary number? It's hard enough with the real numbers. Matrices. Yeah, yeah. My favorite. and all that stuff. And and I did I did well enough in the maths and the physics, but I knew I didn't want to do that going on. So in right. the computing. It turned out that I actually not only was good at programming, but I enjoyed the programming. And it's, it's fun because it's a bit like the maths and the physics because it's got right and wrong answers and it's logical. But um, it's, it's a bit more fun than that because you can play around and see, oh, no one's ever done this before and I could try and do this and how about that? And it was much more exploratory, and it was more creative. So it allowed me to bring in some of the creative stuff from when I was doing like writing and when I was doing art, but doing it in a, a logical fashion. So I, I, I thought it was the, the best of all worlds. So that's why I picked computer science. But I, I picked computer science and AI, and AI yeah. because I still was liking my science fiction. And I still wanted oh, to yeah, do yeah. something. I didn't want to be a programmer. I wanted to do something cool and interesting. And, and I didn't think being a programmer was cool and interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. That's, that's really interesting. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's it. I, I didn't really, I didn't really realize. I didn't really know what being a programmer was about. And I didn't want to. I definitely didn't want to sit behind a desk for 40 hours a week behind a computer because I was very active and I did lots of sports and I, uh, my dad's a basketball coach and you know and I, I wanted to, I didn't want to be sat down all the time I just wasn't that sort of person yeah. I didn't want to be a programmer but um, the the thing that the thing that it does offer you is this is variety of, of solving other people's problems and telling the computer to do something and when it finally gets around to doing it it's like yay it did that cool thing and 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 there's lots of like I said, lots of creativity, even if you're not doing front ends. I was doing quite a lot of front end stuff early on, and web stuff. Yeah. But even if you're not doing something graphical, you're sort of thinking, how can I shape this problem? How can I fix this? How do I design that? Mm -hmm. And um, and so it wasn't just, it, you are sat behind a computer when you're programming, but it, that's not what it's about. It's mm -hmm. about getting up at the whiteboard and talking to your colleagues. And it's about collaborating with people to say, look, I need to do this, but there's going to be four of us doing it. So how do we work together to make this work? It's about talking to the business and saying, when you said you wanted this, did you really want that? Or mm -hmm. what is it you're trying to do? And, and how can I help you do what you want to do? So there's lots of this kind of um, talking to people stuff that you don't realize happens when you're a programmer. You sort of think you're communing with the computer. Right. But you're mm -hmm. not. You're t you, you can't, you're communing with the computer is the easy bit, right? Yeah. Because it, it does what you tell it to, even if you tell it to do something stupid, right? But <laughs> ultimately, that's the logical bit. You say, do this, and it says yes or no. That, so that's, that's kind of, not mechanical, but that's the easy bit. The difficult bit is, I told it to do this, but did that guy over there, is that what he wanted? Yeah. Or did he really mean something else? So you have the difficult bit of translating from the, the fluffy human stuff mm -hmm. into the easy, logical computer stuff. So, so I guess this is kind of where one of my questions that I had kind of framed up was uh, <coughs> the fact that you're a developer and that there's a kind of a difference between a programmer and a developer. Yes. And so let's talk about the difference between a programmer and a developer. So uh, <coughs> being a developer is much more uh, holistic than actually just cutting code and programming. It's more about testing, debugging, uh, writing. But what else does the role of developer specifically mean to you? It, it means, so 
<laughs> I hate this phrase. It means being involved in all aspects of the software lifecycle, <laughs> right? And you see it on people's CV, <laughs> and I think yeah, yeah. If, if, you ha if you're not involved in all aspects <coughs> of the software lifecycle, then you're not a developer, you're just a programmer, yeah. right? No, yeah. and, that, and it means talking to users, or maybe your business analyst, it depends on, on the size of the company, it depends on what you're trying to do. It means talking to people, finding out what they want. It means figuring out some sort of design or specification that it doesn't have to be a big design document it could just be a whiteboard design that uh, you know will this fit your needs will it w is the team does the team think this is going to work with the existing architecture that's kind of a different sort of puzzle and then it's the the coding stuff and i've done a lot of pair programming in my last place the pair mm -hmm. programming is totally different to to programming on your own because you're sat physically next to the person yep. and you have to not want to kill each other. You have to be <laughs> able to communicate. You have to be able to say, look, I'm trying to do it this way and what I've got in my head is this, this and this, which is quite difficult because normally when you're coding on your own, you sort of, you explore, you don't really know exactly what you're trying to yeah, achieve, yeah. you just explore. Yeah, right. But when you're coding with someone else, you need to be able to at least attempt to communicate, well, I'm doing this because I saw this and I thought this and I was thinking maybe about that. And then that that's great because they can tell you early on something like, no, 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 actually, and that's not really applicable because of this. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Or, oh, great idea. Why don't you look over here? Because I know something over here is the same sort of thing. So being able to communicate what you're doing while you're typing is quite tricky. Yeah. And, um, and being able to give you know, being able to negotiate over the design as you're coding it is tricky too, because you're like, I'm right, no, I'm right, no, I'm right. <laughs> and you're both right, and there are good <laughs> and bad points. But one of the best things I thought about pair programming is that when I used to code on my own, I'd be like, right, I'm going to do it this way. No, 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 I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> no, I preferred the other way better, I'm going to do it this way. No, but what about the third way? You know, and when you're coding, you have those conversations before you start typing anything, and then yep. eventually you'll end up with something a bit better. But it's, it's not the same as, as what you think of as programming. You have to right. have these interpersonal skills. And no one tells you you need interpersonal skills as a programmer. Okay. In fact, they often tell you the opposite. It's not true. Okay. You need to be able to speak to people. <coughs> exactly, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I guess I'm just going to quickly follow up with another one of my questions because it's kind of related. So uh, <coughs> programmer, developer is one kind of track through computer science. Uh, do you see any other, or was it evident to you while you were going through uh, your computer science degree uh, that there are other ways you can go within computer science other than just developing and programming? Yeah, I mean, at, at <coughs> university, no, it wasn't evident to me at all. Right. Um, and in actual fact, I was a little bit uh, depressed for a while because I was learning Java at university and I thought, right, well, that's it. I'm going to be a Java programmer for like the rest of my life. That's <laughs> what I've been trained to do. <laughs> and uh, 12 years later, I am still a Java programmer, but <laughs> that's not the point. And many of my other friends left university and started off being Java programmers because that's those are the skills we've been given. Yeah. Um, but they've ended up being um, technical authors or they've ended up being technical project managers or they've right. ended up being BAs or they've ended up being programmers in different languages or they've ended up starting their own company yeah or um, being a consultant. Um, I th consultancy is interesting because it, it means lots of different things, right? It can either be going in and hand-waving at people saying, yeah. oh, you know, you should think about this, or it could be going on site, working with a team and doing coding with them. And right. th there are very different sorts of roles just in that, that one umbrella. So it wasn't evident to me at all. And one of the things that we've been doing in the graduate developer community is doing this um, meet a mentor project. Okay. So you get people in the software industry at the moment and they go into universities and we sit down with students and they ask us questions. And, and, and often they don't really know what questions to ask so you sort of seed it with, you know, this is what I do, this is what my job really involves, you know, do you, do you have any more questions around what it means to be a Java developer? And then I'll often drop in the, the conversation like, because they'll, they'll be thinking, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And then yeah. you'll say, there are other paths, there are other things you can do. Right. And not just with computer science, because at the end <coughs> of the day, you've got a degree and yeah. you've got a scientific-ish degree. Yeah. So that opens up lots of different paths. And you could do a master's in almost anything, right? So you can cross train to something else and at least you've got a degree. Hmm. I mean, exactly. so thinking about your path to where you are, I guess you started off wanting to go to Mars and <laughs> ended up a Java developer, but um, did you feel like you had a plan once you went through university and the steps that you took, the career changes, or was it sort of I happy accidents? I sort of had a, an, an iterative plan, really. I mean, I, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I mean, it <laughs> scared me when you said I've got 12 years of experience. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> that means I graduated a long time ago. You could still get to Mars. I don't could worry. still go to Mars. I could send something that goes to Mars. Um, so, no, I certainly didn't have a, 
this is where I want to be or this is what I want to do. And even now, you know, my, my horizon's probably two years out, maybe right. five. But it, it, there, you know, it gets, you can be more directed within six months to a year, you've got a good idea of where you want to go, and then two years, year, and then five years, well, there's these, I want to make sure I don't cut off these options. Right. So I think the main thing I had was, in terms of planning my career, it was always try not to cut things off, try not to exclude things, which is why I thought, um, which is why I picked my A-levels, which is why I picked computer science, because it wasn't going to stop me following various paths. Okay. And similarly, um, I, I did consultancy for a while because I thought that would open up a lot more stuff to me and I could work in different industries, I could get a feel for how different teams work, I could get a feel for the difference between working in banking versus manufacturing versus um, education um, and, and that way I can, I have more options. So the, I guess my main career thing has not been I want to get here but I want to make sure I can get there if I want to, and there, and there, and there. <laughs> and, and, and the way you do that, instead of being overwhelmed by all those choices is, well, where am I now? What skills do I have? What do I like doing? And what can I do for the next sort of one to two years, which will either move me closer to a particular goal, or more likely, what am I going to do in the next one to two years, which I enjoy, enjoy right. doing? Because mm -hmm. that means then I'm going to carry on enjoying doing what I'm doing and learning more about the stuff I'm enjoying. And so if, you, if you're always stuck, if you're ever stuck, you just think, what do I like doing? I don't like doing that. I don't do it anymore then. Okay. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So I, I guess I have one kind of question going back to what we were talking about uh, a little while ago about CS and CS skills in general. So it seems that CS skills are applicable in a multitude of different roles nowadays. So, you know, that you could be uh, not just technology, even though I don't have any specific examples other than maybe finance and uh, spreadsheets and scripting spreadsheets. And, and scripting seems to be a big thing that's fairly uh, becoming fairly common nowadays. But <coughs> it seems that CS skills are something that we should be learning at a very early age, uh, being very young and maybe even broken out of computer science completely. You know, the, the basic programming, the ability to put programs together and to code things and control your world and your environment through technology. Uh, <coughs> so. Do you feel the same? Do you feel similar? I mean, are we now at the point where CS skills are vital for a wide variety of different roles? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say yes. Yeah. Uh, and I do agree. I, I think what you said was interesting there. I never really thought about it that way. How can we extract the really reusable bits from yeah. CS? It's a, very, it's a very computer science thing to want to do, right? Extract the reusable stuff, the <laughs> reusability. Yeah, but what is applicable? I mean, maybe, <coughs> maybe programming per se might not be, yeah. but maybe algorithms generally is quite useful. I did some pseudocoding back when I was sort of 16 doing algorithmic stuff. And it's a definitely a reusable skill to be able to think, right, I have a particular problem that needs solving. I have a particular set of skills, whether it's an, a, an a particular set of tools. So maybe it's Excel, or maybe it's Office, or maybe it's um, I've got friends over there I can call who can do stuff. And the ability to break down the steps needed to get from here to here, yeah. whether it's because you're trying to create, whether it's because trying, you're trying to plan your wedding, or because you're trying to um, organize your team, or whether it's because you're trying to write a program, those sorts of skills are definitely right. useful. Um, but I also think that um, things like, I, I mean, I, I think the, the mathematical logic stuff is useful. Um, and I think that I think data structures is absolutely fundamental if you're going to do anything even slightly computer science-y, but yeah. probably not so reusable. But I think that sort of thing should be taught at school. And, right. and the UK government's been doing some stuff around that, that area in terms of changing the focus from ICT to computer science. Yeah. And I think that's the right thing to do. Okay. I think technical skills are really important. I think you should be able to type for a start, right? And I think you should be able to use Word and PowerPoint and Excel and things. Excel in particular is, is used in a lot of different places. Yeah. But um, I think teaching computer science is a separate thing to ICT is important because learning to use a tool is one thing, but learning to create the tool is an entirely different set of skills. Yeah. And okay. I think that um, we as developers and as technical professionals, we need to help teachers teach that. Because 
they they don't have the the time to we've spent 10 years developing these skills right we yeah. know them we do them day in day out and teachers they teach very well they do that day in day out but they have to teach all these different subjects right, right? Yeah, exactly. and uh, I think if you're going to teach computer science well you need to get computer scientists in to teach computer science well so I think it's a really good idea to try and reach out to schools and say do you need any help I, yeah. I can offer you some hours per week to in terms do of it. volunteer programs that kind of thing yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah sharing sharing your abilities and your knowledge with uh, students and such like yeah, really cool idea I mean we do some of that at Google already so yeah, and yeah. Lots of lo there's lots of different projects for <coughs> it, and, yeah. and that's the interesting thing. There's lots of little seeds of ideas, and I wonder if there's scope at some point to be able to start pulling this together and saying, if you want to work in this area or in this technology or with these schools, then these are the programs which are available, and this is how you get in, And because you have to do things like be, um, uh, you have to have your CRB check, and you need to be cleared to work with kids and things right. like that. So it would be great to have someone, some central place to say, right, how do I get involved with this sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, definitely. Some kind of registry or something uh, where you can say, or some kind of volunteer registry where you can say, I'm able to do this, I'm able to supply these kind of skills. And, uh, yeah, you know. like a sort of um, match.com for, uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> for schools of computer science. I mean, some of us, I mean, some, some of us are actually scared of actually standing in front of a, a, a classroom of children Yeah. <laughs> and being exposed to that and you know, having your you know, just your primal instincts kind of like challenge. Of you know, course. This is my nightmare, standing in front of a, a group of children and they're going to ask me questions <laughs> that I can't answer. Exactly, and kids don't really have the same sort of barriers that, exactly, that adults yeah, have. They'll yeah. ask all sorts of stuff. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, that's why I think that, uh, I mean, that's the stuff that teachers are really good at, right? Yeah, definitely. So that's what we can learn off the teachers, yeah. and, and the teachers can learn some ICT, st oh, not ICT, sorry, computer science stuff computer off science. us. Yeah, okay. Thanks, this man. is a good idea for a new starter, the match.com of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> technology professionals in schools. It's good. Obviously integrated with Google AdWords. <laughs> 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 um, so while we're talking about education, actually, I was thinking, you know, um, you know, there's been so many advancements in technology for education lately. Things like these massive open online courses and things like this, and apps you can get for education. What are your thoughts on this and how it's uh, changing how we educate? I think it's amazing. Uh, my parents are teachers, so I'm really interested in the education side of stuff, and um, I think that. I've got so many thoughts going through my head, I don't know how to, <laughs> how to face them all. Mm -hmm. um, so, TenGen are running online education for MongoDB at the moment. They, w they ran um, a course um, using Python and, and we're now running one using Java. So, yep. it's definitely something that, that me and my day job, I'm actually reasonably involved in. And, and we found it very, very useful because it scales much better. Now, we could hire a bunch of consultants, teach them how to teach MongoDB, teach them how to teach developers how to code and then we could sell those consultants into into uh, places of work and we could make loads of money off that but it's not very scalable and and the ability to make sure that all your consultants are teaching the same sort of thing and the consistency the branding it's, it's a little bit more difficult and actually if you're a software firm sure you can make money doing that but it's probably not the best thing to do so as a software firm what you should do is provide an online training platform it then I um, you could charge for it if you wanted to, but yeah. you know why should you? Because the point is, you're training people up on how to use your technology, and if people use, want to use your technology and know how to use it properly, your support costs are lower. They're they're using your technology. They're spreading the word and saying that you're amazing. It's, it's just a very very good thing to do. Yeah. And like I said, it's scalable. You can put this online course there with lectures, and 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 then people really the interaction is is you can still have emails and things like that. So you still need people at the end of the line, but you don't have to send someone into train someone for like a week. Right. So that's from a corporate point of view, it's definitely a, it's almost a no-brainer if you can invest the time in it. Yeah. From um, like a, a more widespread point of view, it's just, it, the internet opens up so much for us, right? We could do so much now. We can, we can learn stuff we never could have learned before. We can find out about things we never could have found out before. And you can do, the, the things like the open university stuff has totally changed. You don't have to get loads of packets of information, mm -hmm. pieces of paper, you <laughs> yeah. can do it online and you can you can do stuff in your own time and I think it allows you to improve yourself and educate yourself uh, at your own pace yeah. and at that I think anything which is about learning and improving is, is a good thing. I've seen a lot more, in fact I've been approached by a bunch of people about creating software for homeschooling kids, particularly in America okay. and, and I find that really really interesting too. I'm not sure how much I agree with that because I think kids need to learn how to interact with other people. I think that's the most important thing you learn at school. I don't think it's maths and science. I think it's how people are different to your family unit, and you need to learn to negotiate with those people and play nicely with others. Um, but you know, if you 
if we're worried about consistency of teaching in schools across the UK or across the US or whatever, you can plug some of those holes by providing some homeschooling staff or some online education staff. And, and it doesn't matter then where you live or what school your kid goes to or, or in even necessarily what background you're from. You can actually just, you can provide your kid with opportunities to, to improve themselves and move on and do stuff they couldn't have done 20 years ago. Mm. So I think it's really exciting. And I'm using Rosetta Stone to learn Spanish at the moment, and that's amazing, because <laughs> it kind of just forces you. It's, it's very well designed. It's a very well designed piece of software, and I keep thinking in my head, I'm like, I wonder how they did this. And it's really amazing how they've planned the material to be really sensibly organized. And, and, and then I'm, and I'm reporting bugs as well. That doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. But it's a, it's, I wouldn't, I've been thinking about learning a new language for 10 years, and being able to put aside the same hour of every week to go to a class to learn it is never going to happen. It's yep. just, you know, it's even before I was traveling all over the world, that was just never going to happen. Because on, sometimes on a Thursday at 6 o'clock, I might not want to, you know. Yeah. I might want to have pizza and sit at home and watch telly, <laughs> you know. So I think that um, the online stuff just allows you to be more flexible about learning. So I guess you talked earlier about uh, offline. <laughs> you talked about gamification and also uh, <coughs> my other thing would be the social aspects of uh, education materials, things like Rosetta Stone, where you can interact with other people online, uh, people maybe at the same level as you, people you can speak with and, and practice and converse with. Uh, that's really interesting. So uh, you, do you do much of the social interaction side on Rosetta Stone? And other no, because I, I say, oh, I'm going to meet with my Spanish friends and I'm going to talk Spanish oh, right, to those okay, guys, yeah. which I don't. Yeah, but, exactly. you know, I so, but the fact that it is there and the fact that you could sort of speak to someone uh, who knows that you're a learner, who's there to <coughs> help you um, and, and correct you if necessary. It's I think that's I think that's a good thing if you like that sort of thing. Me, I'm a bit shy and I'm like I don't want to speak to someone in my rubbish Spanish. I, yeah. I'd rather just like I'd rather speak to the machine. And that's one of the other good things about online learning is that you can kind of you can guide it according to what your what your preferences are. Yeah. Me, I don't want to talk to real people. So when I talk to the machine, it's much better. I think the one downside of that though, is that ultimately when you're going to speak Spanish, you're going to be speaking to other people. I, I know. Then. But you know, I'll cross that bridge when I get good enough <laughs> exactly. to speak to those people. <laughs> I just quickly mentioned as well that the Open University, I'm, I've been uh, on the Open University for like five years. And right. <coughs> their materials and their, their website and such like is, is so well up to date now. Uh, the materials they have, they have Android applications and iOS applications for reading material. Uh, so they're really up to speed and they're, they're doing a great job of uh, making things happen. And I know they're kind of resource constrained uh, and struggling to get budget and such like, but they're doing a really, good, really, really good job. I think having the different platforms is really interesting as well. I wanted to pick um, a language learning tool that I could use on my phone, on my iPad, on my laptop, because yeah. And, and I, the only thing that I'm <coughs> struggling with is that most of them don't work offline. And of course, in London, yeah. on the Tube, you're not yeah. online. Yeah. Um, and so lots of iPad apps are great because most of them are designed to work on offline. Yeah. And, and then you can just do it like, oh, I've got five minutes. I'm on the train. I'll read this or I'll do this exercise or whatever. And I think that's something we didn't have you know, uh, three years ago. Yeah, definitely. At the same time, I mean, I'm learning Japanese, and I have applications. I have like six or seven applications on my, on my Android phone. That I use constantly when I'm in situations like standing up on the train right. uh, and I want to just quickly test my vocabulary or practice my verbs and that kind of thing. I just fire up the application and just stand there and, and do something useful at that time, which right. otherwise would have been wasted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You'd just be playing Sudoku on your phone, which is what I'm doing. Like. <laughs> or, you know, you wouldn't open up your laptop and get, get started on something, which exactly. is really... Yeah, yeah. Not if you're standing up, definitely. Yeah, it just changes the way that you learn. It Absolutely. changes yeah, everything. It's fantastic. Mm. So I guess on that same subject, and I, that, I think that question is kind of a follow-up to this one, but I think we can still talk about it, is uh, technology is pervasive. I think you said it permeates everything that we do. <coughs> it's used to build the fabric for our clothes. You know, these, these fibres that we have in our clothes now are crazy. You know, they're all nanotechnology, that kind of thing. It's used to process our food, uh, <laughs> hopefully beef, mainly not <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's used to condition our air. And uh, computer science uh, is really you know, enabling technology. Uh, everywhere, and uh, it's no longer just about creating large software applications such as Microsoft Office. Yeah. Uh, you know, computer science and technology is a, about a much larger thing. It's kind of permeating everything that we do. <coughs> so, what do you see as the role of computer science in the modern world, uh, well, not just education? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think you you kind of said it is that it's everywhere. It impacts everything. It impacts where you're going to dig a well in Africa, you know. It's, it impacts, um, you know, like I say, how, you, how your clothes are designed or how... You, I mean, I don't think IKEA could be as cheap for tables if they didn't have 
like they've obviously got CAD software, but they've probably got also really cool, I've seen this at Ford, they've got cool pieces of software which design the way that you're going to plug stuff together, tells you the order in which you should plug stuff together, and then can create a manual for that sort of thing. You know, and this is the sort of thing that allows you to then hire a particular type of person to be able to do that very easily, or to sell it to people and say, look, that, that's just go, it's just there for you. And computer science is, done right makes all of our lives easier yeah. right but it does mean that there's actually going to be more and more and more computer science type jobs and they're all going to be really different sorts of jobs yeah. so I think there was a worry maybe in the 90s maybe in some of the noughties that um, we when we come from uh, coding basic in the 80s it was kind of you knew you could write your little application it might be a game or it might be something and you yeah. could sort of hold the whole thing in your head and code it all and then in basic and you're sort of done. In the 90s things got bigger and more modular and, and we started coding and we started using PCs so you can always see what was under the covers you couldn't just type basic into the command line and there was this kind of concern that computer science was getting so big and almost so enterprise that there's no way you could start really easily yeah. write a little thing uh, and and grow from there because you were going to have to be working on Microsoft Word or some banking payroll application or you know it was going to be some big enterprise thing. I think that um, everything everything has changed in the last I don't know decade maybe because what we've seen is as some of those things have got bigger and we've got these platforms, it gives you these things grow up here and then something has to fill that space and then these things grow over here into clothing technology or into um, uh, oh, home automation. How cool is that? <laughs> I can get my iPad and I can like open my curtains from work. I don't know why I need to do that, but I might need to, you know. And and, and this is this is crazy cool stuff. And and Raspberry Pi and all these things. And it allows you to, t if you if you're interested in mechanical stuff, because I know some people find the computer science bit a bit abstract. Yeah. If you want to see something happen, you can do robotics and and Raspberry Pi and home automation. If you want to do something which is quick and visual, you could do like um, a Facebook game or you could do um, Android apps are quite easy to write and things like that. Um, but if you want to do something like really more mathematical and abstract, you could go and write the matching engine in a bank somewhere or, or an algo for a trading algorithm. Yeah. There's just so much. So whatever you want to do, there's going to be something there that, that interests you. And I yeah. think that's really... I think that's a message which isn't really getting across. I think we still think of programmers as, as sort of sitting down and writing Java code yep. and and writing payroll applications for banks, yep. when instead of thinking about you know um, I don't know, like I say, the home automation stuff is cool. I just think that's awesome, being able to almost program your own house to do whatever it wants to, take yeah, over the world. Way. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess we had conversations about the creativity of uh, <coughs> the creativity or the creative aspect of uh, computer science um, as opposed to programming being of itself, you know, just something that you do uh, as being a means to an end, you know, actually there's something you can build from it. It's like <coughs> uh, knitting or crochets or Lego bricks, anything like that. You can actually build something with it. I think there's always been this kind of illusion that uh, you can just program and it didn't have to have an end goal. Or right. End goal. But now people are using it to be creative and uh, I think the more of that that you see everywhere, uh, the, the better it will get and the more things will change and more people will see that the options uh, when it comes to choosing roles within computer science are, are much more varied now. I think um, this is one of my long-term stretch goals. I would like Hollywood to change the image of computer programmers. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I think they still uh, they still portray people as being coding for the sake of coding or, yeah. or some sort of magician who does his magic thing over here yeah. and no one else, and when I say <laughs> his, I obviously mean his, <laughs> um, magic thing over there and, and, and no one else will understand that. No one else understands me because I'm a... I'm a yeah. magic secret computer programmer. Yeah. And I, I'd like to see people um, express how creative it is and how um, you could do something because y your mum says, um, I really need something to help map my family tree. Yeah. And you can write a family tree app in, in whatever you want to. Or I need something which is like, um, I don't know, like recipe apps. I think they're kind of cool. It sounds a bit girly, doesn't it? <laughs> no, but like, no, but um, they are cool. They are cool. <laughs> it's kind of. I would love to see something where you say, right, I've got um, these things in my cupboard. Can you tell me what um, what I can make? And yeah. it'll tell you. You can make um, a Victoria sponge cake with cheese on top. That's quite <laughs> what I wanted. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'd like to see. I, I think it's very, very creative, and I'd like it's that. I'd like more people to be aware of how creative it is. Mm -hmm. oh, definitely. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about when you were talking about your career path and how you got from where you are. And it sounded like you've made these really wise decisions <laughs> along the way to sort of keep your options open and not sort of be tied down into 
these kind of areas. But um, has there been someone that's influenced your life? You know, what's the best advice you've been given to help you make those decisions? I had lots. I've had lots of advice along the way, obviously, and each each bit of advice was rel was the best advice given my position at that moment in time and and for where I was going to go. So. Um, there's, there's two examples actually because in some ways in some ways they're the same and in some ways they're different. When I started, uh, um, I worked at Ford Motor Company and there were a lot of guys there who were from um, various consultancies because they're one of these large organizations that gets consultants in to help them. Mm -hmm. And one of the consultants said to me, this is my very first placement, I was still at university so it was my three month vacation placement. And um, he said, you know, if you want to, if you want to get ahead, you have to play a bit of politics. And I'm like, I'm this geek girl programmer who like likes science fiction and the logical bit of computers, but also I'm a creative artist type. I don't want to play politics. That's exactly what I don't want to do. I don't want to play games and things like that. But, but he kind of explained it to me and he said, look, you're in a difficult position because you're, um, you're sat behind a computer all day, every day, and you could be doing the best work ever, you could be doing the worst work ever, and no one will know unless you tell people. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to tell mm -hmm. people that y you're good. And, um, and I'm like, yeah, but what if I'm not good? It's like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, if you want to get on, you, you're gonna have to tell people what you're good at and, and how mm -hmm. good you are. And of course, being the sort of person who doesn't really lie about things like that, then I'll tell them the things I'm good at and the things I'm bad at. And, and that, to me, that translated to actually just being visible. So getting involved in, um, I helped, because uh, I was one of the undergraduates at Ford, we used to rotate between placements. So I helped some of the placement rotation. And that was self-serving because I wanted to make sure I got a good placement. But it was also self-serving because management would see these, these undergraduates are helping with the process and they have these skills to be management material or whatever. So I got more involved with that sort of thing, just for the visibility. And it ended up helping my career, not just for the visibility, but because I got a bit more control over my career because I was in a position where I could influence my own career. So that was good. And, and I learned that politics does matter if you're a programmer. And that's kind of depressing, but I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Yeah. The other best piece of advice I had, which changed my life in the last two years, is um, I was complaining about one of the conferences, when would this be, maybe three years ago, maybe two years ago, not that long ago, one of the conferences only had white men speaking. Right. And um, actually there was a woman, but she didn't have her um, icon up there, so you couldn't see her face in this <laughs> whole sea of white <laughs> males. So I was complaining about this to Martin Fowler, who works at ThoughtWorks. Yep. And um, he'd come over to ThoughtWorks UK and he was meeting with a few people. And, and this, I was really starstruck because I'm like, this is like Martin Fowler. He's written books and everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was complaining about this thing. And he said, well, why don't you volunteer to speak? And I was like, what? I said, well, look, you're in absolutely the right position to change that. You are a female technical person. And the conference organizers I don't think they've excluded people like you on mm. purpose. You, you can, if, if you go to them and say, can I talk, and they say no, then you can start saying, oh, these people are really unfair. Mm. But don't just complain to me in a pub about yeah. there not being enough women speakers when you're a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, OK. So um, by the end of that year, um, another, another colleague, oh, my, my boss actually, was speaking at Java One. He said, do you want to come up and co-present with me? And I was like, no, <laughs> don't be silly. <laughs> and, um, and because of what Martin Fowler had said, and because of the original comment about being visible and about telling people, you know, giving visibility over what you may or may not be good at, um, I, I, and because it scared the absolute, <laughs> you know, I was, just, I was like, that sounds like a really terrible thing to do. Yeah. Um, I, I said yes, and I did it, yeah. and and that uh, and that's why I am where I am right now because I, I decided oh this is quite it's not easy by any means but this is quite good actually and it's you get to travel and meet people and talk to them and and, um, and that's that's as much fun as programming in some ways and um, and that's how I got my new job. I, I think it's kind of something that's kind of ingrained in us when we're young that we can't change things you know the world is the way it is and we can't do yeah. anything about it and I think my time at Google, I found that I can actually change things, and it's probably for the first time in my life that I can say, "We're not doing this right. You know, let's do it differently." And people will listen and, and take action. I think it's something that 
it takes a long time and <laughs> a lot of experience to realise you can actually do. And it probably takes some successes as well. It probably, I, <coughs> you can probably get frustrated. I need to change that. I can't change it. Uh, there is no way for me to change it. But then when the opportunity comes along and you take it, uh, then it, it can be really enabling because you know, suddenly you realise you can change pretty much everything if you, if you put enough effort into it. Yeah, exactly. And I think that as as technical programming type people, we're almost exactly the right people to change things. We're used to taking a piece of code and changing it or, yeah. or, or getting it to work in a different way. We're used to systems thinking. We're used to thinking, okay, this goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, consequently that, oh, that's not right, let's do this. And we're exactly the right people to go, okay, so if this is what's happening, if this is how things work, it doesn't have to work that way. You know, my job is to change stuff, whether it's at the byte level or whether it's people level. You can. If you present to people sometimes the system that has led to this conclusion and say, well, you know what, if we did this bit a little bit differently, things might change, people will go, oh, OK. And, but as you said, successes are kind of important. And the first few times you do that, yeah. the first many times you do that, chances are pretty good. Someone will say, what do you know? Mm. And, and that's fine, because you haven't, you haven't proved anything yet. You just have to keep doing it until you get a couple of successes. Yeah. And then when you've got a few successes, you say, oh, I don't know anything about it, but I did this over here, and it worked. Yeah. You know? Let's just keep going. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I think mean, that brings me on to the, one of the questions I kind of pulled from your bio because you said something that is obviously important to you. you. You believe that people shouldn't always have to make the same mistakes again and again. So my question to you is: Do you mean that by this we should learn from our own experiences, or do you mean that through sharing knowledge and experience we can help others not to make the same mistakes again and again and again? Well, both, of course. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean. How often do you kick yourself when you've made the same mistake the third time? I don't necessarily mean mistyping the wrong thing. It might yeah. be mistyping the wrong thing, or it might be... Um, Remove um, minus R star in the yeah, oh God, I've done that. <laughs> I've done that in a... You, know, you in only a do that once. Production. Right? Yes, you only do that once. I've done that in a production-like environment, and I've never made the same mistake again. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you, you, you always want to learn from your own mistakes, and it might be just a case of... It's, it might be dumb stuff like, I came into work when I was feeling ill again, and I'm not doing anything again. Next time, I'm not going to do that. Um, but I feel quite a lot like I've learned a lot of things the hard way. I mean, I've had good advice from various people along the way, but it, like I said, it always seems to be sort of just-in-time advice. And, and I kind of feel like some of the stuff that I learned the hard way without that advice, I'd like to tell graduates or undergraduates or, or, or kids that stuff now. Not like, like everything. I don't need to right. download 12 <laughs> years of experience yeah. into their brains. But right. um, stuff like, for me, I was always, because I was always on this sort of one to two year horizon, I was always frantically trying to take chances to make sure they didn't escape. Mm. I have to do this, this, this and this because I might never get a chance to do it ever again. Uh, and it's not true because you'll come back later. Your, your career works in cycles and your, your life works in cycles yeah. and, and um, a chance, if it's the right chance, will come up again or it, it disappears off the radar and it turns out it wasn't that important anyway. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think I... I think that it's important for, I'd like to share with people, yeah, lots of stuff I kind of learned the hard way, but it's not like this is how you do domain-driven design, it's more like this is what you might want to bear, when, yeah. bear in mind when you manage yeah. your career. Not like this is how you manage your <coughs> career, but don't, well, don't worry about this, do worry about that. It's this a kind of Confucian important. wisdom, it's like you're kind of making a point. Uh, and mm -hmm. that you can apply this to your life in some way, but you don't necessarily, it's not a kind of rigid thing that you have to kind of adhere to. Completely. Right, it's, m it's more like a, a, a set of things like, have you considered this? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you think about that? Yeah. And, and you might, if, if, if there is a question, your answer, your correct answer might be yes, or your correct answer might be no, but the point is, did you consider the question? Mm -hmm. okay. I like that approach, although you're talking about learning from mistakes, it's probably, you know, things that, and we talked about successes and how that, propels you forward some way, but often you probably learn more from your failures than your successes in a lot of ways, and it's good to share that with others. And I think so. Yeah. Uh, and I, in fact, I proposed a track at QCon London called, um, well, it was going to be called Learning from Failure, because when you go to conferences, and I've been to a few in the last year or so, you get a lot of people saying, we did this this way and it worked. And you're like, great, but we're not you. We don't have your team. We don't use those technologies. Which lesson, what lessons am I going to take from this That's particular point, yeah. thing? Mm -hmm. So I said, how about we have some a few brave souls step up and say, we did this, 
and it was rubbish. And we tried that, <laughs> and it didn't work. And you know, we we did, we we experimented with this technology, and it didn't work for us because not like this technology is rubbish, but because we didn't consider the business needs, or our team wasn't skilled on it, or you know. And I think that it's much easier to learn from those things than it is because I reckon for every success, there's got to be I don't know ninety failures, or even mm -hmm. it's even if it's two failures, the, uh, the the number of failures massively outweighs the number of successes. And learning from that one success that happened in that one time at that one place with those people. You can't, if you reproduce what happened to get there, you'll get there, and they're already there. <laughs> you don't want to be there. You want to be where you want to be. So you want to make sure that you don't do the failure stuff that happened around those cases. Yeah, I like to talk about that too, because it, you know, I don't know, you might get disheartened if you sort of w try something that doesn't work, and you make these mistakes, and just to not let it set you back, but to keep you sort of going forward. Yeah. And it's an easy thing to say, to say, oh, don't worry about it. It's like. But I am worried about <laughs> it, and you should worry about it because if you don't think about it, you will make the same mistake again. But I think this is particularly important for, this is gonna be a gross generalization and stereotype, but for British people, because the Americans are a bit better, Americans specifically are a bit better at um, understanding that success comes with, with a price, and you could have nine startup failures, and the 10th one might be the right one. And, and they're okay with that. They're kind of okay with trying again and again and again. I think for the Brits, if you, if you fail once, it's like, oh, well. <laughs> if you fail <laughs> twice, it's like, well, you're never gonna get anywhere, <laughs> right? And I think that we should, be a much, we should be much better at saying, yes, but the second time I failed, I didn't fail for the same reason. And the third time I fail, it'll be for a different reason again. Yeah. And to see that, that incremental change. Interesting, yeah, okay. Okay, so I guess one other question I had, probably the last question, about, he's talking about role models. Um, so, which is primarily for me, one of the main reasons we do Women Tech Makers is to uh, present people with role models. Uh, <coughs> so, how do you think we can do more to establish, uh, using programs like Women Tech Makers and such like, to establish role mo models, aspirational people, that, uh, young people looking to decide whether to get into technology, to choose technology as a, an educational path or a career path? Uh, how, what more can we do to establish role models uh, for young people? I think there's, there's two sides to it. I think lots of organizations, lots of communities, lots of educational groups are very keen on creating and promoting role models. Well, not creating them, but finding them and promoting them. But I think that the, the thing I've been trying to tell people is um, to tell people that they are role models. Because you get people saying, yes, I think we should have more <laughs> women role models, or yes, we should have less white people at the top. Um, and, and I'm like, yeah, but, but you're a woman. Do you want to do you want to come and talk at this conference? No. <laughs> um, you know, you're you're um, one of. I mean, I, I don't even want to really talk about the race thing because we're all like white, right? But um, you know, if if people start complaining about their particular minority being not well represented, like I was complaining about no women speakers, then um, it's it's really up to you to step up and represent that. Well. Okay, so yes, you're going to represent that minority, and one of the things that makes me really uncomfortable is every time someone asks me to speak for women developers, I go, yep, yeah, I can't really do that. I can speak for me, and I, I am a woman developer, and some people might find that what I say is the truth, and some people might go, might completely disagree. Mm -hmm. If someone completely disagrees with my viewpoint and completely disagrees with me representing women tech makers, then I would love to see them step up and represent their viewpoint, and that's great. It gives you the balance and say, there's, there's more than one of us. We do lots of different things. So I think that um, I think people need to step up the same way I was told to step up. I right. think that you know it, you can do it. it. It is important, and you are a role model, and you're a role model probably because you're not like everyone else. Probably because there isn't someone up there who looks like you, and. Um, and if you step up and you are that role model, you get to represent your viewpoint. It's the same thing I said about the, the getting involved in the rotations thing, right? If by stepping up and representing your viewpoint and having a voice, you get to change things so that it works for you, yeah. right? So you, you could do it for all those people who want to look at you and be a role model if you want, but basically it's good for you. Yeah. It's very inspiring words to end on. <laughs> So I guess my last point is, when are you going to Mars? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with you. So Maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really keen to go to Mars. Uh, even if it's a one-way trip, I'd probably, I'd probably I, go. I know, I thought about terraforming Mars. How cool <laughs> yeah, would that be, and being so like a colonist? <laughs> would be awesome. But um, I actually spoke to some NASA people at, um, where was that? Uh, OzCon last year. They had some um, NASA people coming and doing some of the, the coding for kids stuff at right. OzCon. 
and I was like, can I have a job in NASA, please, please, please? <laughs> and they said, do you have an American green card? I said, no. Oh, oh well, uh, we do have some people in, in um, uh, mm. some university in London doing some coding. I was like, yeah, but I don't really want to be stuck in some university in London doing some coding. Mm -hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I want to go to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> you should join the British space program. Didn't they collapse that a few years ago? <laughs> we may have one. We should have one. We should have a secret one. We should have one. Mm -hmm. We should probably form one. <laughs> That's my next startup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, brilliant. So thank you ever so much, Tricia. It's been really wonderful talking to you. It's been such no a lot of fun. I don't, I don't know how long this has gone on for. But it's, been <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> so it's awesome. Okay, so that's the end of our session with uh, Trisha G. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, look out for more sessions from the UK uh, when we're tech makers. From Campus London. Thanks. Cheers. Bye bye. <coughs>